The title of my talk tonight is uh, Everything is Workable, Really. When my uh, husband got the newsletter that Judy sent out that had the title of the talk, I told him I would tell you this tonight. Uh, when he got the newsletter, he looked at me and he said, well, that should be interesting. <laughs> because our lives have been just turned inside out with one crisis after another. Um, so uh, he said, I can hardly wait to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> so I explained to him what I had to say. But he was laughing at me because I'm not always so incredibly brilliant about handling it all. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had an EAR, an Ethics and Reconciliation uh, Team uh, presentation that was also titled, Everything is Workable. And after that, um, some, someone's, someone's have asked if we could elaborate a little bit more <laughs> about the everything is workable part. Um, and so uh, I thought I'd do a talk tonight that kind of goes a little bit more into, into uh, depth about how we practice with everything is workable. Um, everything is workable. There actually are f kind of five points that I want to explore. And um, just as uh, I suggested last week, you might, as you listen, really kind of feel your way into one that resonates for you. You know, oh, I really should or could explore this one a little bit more. I could deepen this quality of my practice a little bit more. And just see if there's something that touches you and resonates. You don't have to work too hard conceptually at it. Just allow it to emerge uh, if it does. Um, and the first uh, place that I'd like you to focus, I invite you to focus, is what we worked with in the meditation itself. You know, when we want to work with something that is challenging or difficult, we really want to be grounded in our bodies and in some kind of balance in our bodies. If we're so either um, overwhelmed that we, you know, we just can't process information, or if we're so, if you will, underwhelmed, sometimes we respond to difficulty by just kind of zoning out, you know, tuning out. It's just too much. So if we notice that we're in one of those extremes, then really the challenge really is to come back into being grounded in our bodies, balanced in our bodies, before we really try to do anything else. It's just sort of an ordinary, am I breathing? When we're under stress, we tend to stop breathing. That, you know, that breathing practice that I invited you to do um, you will notice, and you already have, I'm sure, that when you're under stress, actually your breathing gets very short and your exhale gets even shorter, um, you know, so that we're really kind of not breathing all that well. So we want to be breathing, we want to be in our feet, in our, you know, feeling the ground underneath our feet. We want to be able to see the world. Sometimes when we're not, uh, when we're under stress, our vision gets kind of very internal and, and we don't even see what's, uh, what's around us. We want to hear the world. We want to be in our senses. We want to be in our bodies. Um, so we don't want to try to do some of these other meditation practices without being grounded in that way because what they will, would likely do if we aren't grounded is actually make it worse. Well, that's no fun, you know. Uh, so we really want to start with that kind of um, at least some quality of balance in our bodies. We don't have to be like perfectly, you know, whatever that means, but, but some kind of balance. So we want to look to see what's going on in my body. Am I sleeping enough? Am I taking enough time, you know, to just relax and chill and not work so hard? Am I taking naps? Am I walking in the woods? Am I spending time with my puppy or my kitty or whatever? eating good food, nourishing food, you know. So we want to we start there. So in terms of everything is workable, that really is the heart of the Buddha's message. That no matter what conflict, no matter what stress, no matter what difficulty we're experiencing, this too is workable. 
This too is a doorway to freedom and a doorway to liberation. Everything is workable. Every conflict, every stress, every disagreement, every sorrow, every suffering, everything that's external, everything in the news, everything that's internal, everything that goes on in my body, my mind, Everything is workable. You know, the Buddha teaches, you've heard it a million times, I teach suffering and the end of suffering. I teach you to notice difficulty and to find the end of suffering with, with it, with that, whatever that, whatever that is. Um, and it's a very personal practice. It's not like we can get things to work, you know, it's like everything is workable means I can, (laughs) God help me, Uh, I can get those 13, count them, 13 contractors who I've had to hire for my house um, to to kind of fix everything so it's not really a problem. Um, So it's not like I can get everything out there or I can actually fix everything so that they'll all go away. Um, You know, that's not how it's workable. It's workable in how we relate to and how we navigate. So it's not, work, it's not fixable externally. It's not fixable internally. We know that, don't we, when we relate to our own bodies and the ways that our own bodies work. Um, so that isn't what it means, that somehow we can fix things. Um, we can get everything to go the way we want it. Um, years ago in a retreat with Shinzen Yang, he, he s- said this, and I, have, I just noted it and I remembered it ever since. He said, re- resurrection is the heart of Buddhism. Dying is the easy part. Hmm. You know, dying, suffering, sinking under stress. He said, that's the easy part. Really finding the resurrection, finding the workableness, um, is the heart of Buddhism. So as we um, kind of begin the inquiry together, I just would like you to notice if there's any quality arising for you of curiosity. Yeah. Like, all right, Sharon, or all right, Buddha, how does, what about that? Or, Okay, I'm taking notes. <laughs> you know, so just notice if there's any quality of curiosity that's arising, any quality of uh, uh, wonder, and notice the wholesomeness of that. That we're invited to kind of begin to inquire with some curiosity when the Buddha teaches these things really? Like, how does this work? Does it work? So if there's any quality of curiosity that's arising, cherish that. Note it. That's a wholesome quality of mind and heart. Okay? If there's any quality of, oh yeah, that too we can count as curiosity. Just invite you to have kind of an open mind and heart. Prove it. Actually, I can't prove it. You can only prove it in your own experience. I can offer some thoughts, which are my understanding of what the Buddha is offering. Uh, the Buddha invite the Buddha himself said, you know, as famously said, you know, I I can't prove anything to you. Uh, he once asked his his major his uh, kind of senior disciple. Uh, uh, you know, do you believe what I just said? And he said, mm, not yet. And he said, good, that was a good response. You know, he said, I haven't really discovered that in my own experience yet, but I will take it to heart and inquire. So I just invite you as you listen and as you contemplate, you know, that kind of curiosity and that kind of taking it to heart and in- inquiry. So as we did last week, um, I invite you to bring into mind some challenge or difficulty, some, some unworkable thing, <laughs> some, something that really seems quite 
difficult. It might be something very close to home in, in, in that it's in your own internal experience, some relational difficulty, you know, that you're having, maybe some, even some difficulty that you're having with your own mind or emotions. Or it could be a relational difficulty with another person. It could be um, some kind of more public difficulty, um, how much it's raining, um, you know, could be anything. could be the news. Something that causes some stress for you and that a, and a bit of puzzlement about how is this workable. How does this uh, lead me, how, how does working with this lead to freedom from suffering? So I'll be quiet for just a second while you contemplate. So we bring into mind a conflict. I looked up the definition of conflict and I, as I was writing it down, I thought, oh right, like we need a definition of conflict. To come into disagreement, incompatibility, in opposition, to fight or contend or do battle, a prolonged struggle, controversy or quarrel, a fight or battle. Conflict, some kind of difficulty that we experience. And the teachings invite us to notice that these places where we get caught in difficulty are actually holy, H-O-L-Y, doorways. When we kind of inquire right at that place, it's actually a doorway into a deeper understanding and a deeper freedom. They're really rather precious places. Often they don't feel like such precious places. But they're really very precious places and part of our spiritual practice. So in that way, conflict becomes good news. When investigated well, it it can enable us to see where we're caught, to see where we're misunderstanding something, confused, where we're trying to learn something new. So they can be, you know, when we're really kind of landing nicely in that place of difficulty, um, it can be really a a real blessing. So the the second, I said the first one is to, um, the first point that I wanted to make was about Um, paying attention really to the balance of the body. And the second is simple mindfulness. Noticing the experience of stress or difficulty. Um, Something that feels, where where we feel caught. Um, That's actually the first noble truth. Just noticing that experience in the body. mm, Noticing it. This is dukkha. This relational stress this difficulty in the world, um, this weather that I can't control, whatever it is, this is dukkha. Um, And the first noble truth invites us, dukkha is the the Pali word for suffering. This is stress. This This is a challenging situation. And it can be known. That's the first noble truth. The Buddha invites us to know Stress. Not as the end point. He's not inviting us to kind of sink into it or wallow in it, but to know it as that doorway. Mindfulness. So the body, second one is mindfulness. Okay. And then the third one I want to spend a little bit more time on is um, uh, investigation. And investigation um, can work in a couple ways. One is investigating the experience in the body as, as I know this experience. What's it like for me to be 
caught in impatience? What's it like for me in my body to be worried? What's it like in my body to be annoyed? Where is it landing in my physical body? So we notice it in the body and then we start to investigate it. Um, I wanted to read you, I think, I think I may have read this last week, but I'll do it again, um, a quote from Ayakima. And she said, first one hears, we hear the teaching, and then we remember, we remember the teaching, and then how am I going to do this? That's the investigation step. How does this work, and how am I going to do this? And she says, if this step doesn't happen, no matter how many books or understandings, there is no help or progress on the spiritual path. So just reading about it or thinking about it isn't really going to get us um, through that doorway. Um, so the question is, how am I going to do this? And it's a path, she says, it takes time. And then over time, she says, one can also know that one's inner being is changing as one recalls how in the past certain things would have been upsetting, anger, sadness, worry, but are now not quite as, as quite so much. That over time, things can change. But then the question, you know, in terms of investigation, how do we do this? Um, and in short, there is no short. <laughs> We want to think there is, don't we? We want to think, you know, that maybe by, you know, it's 10 after 8, maybe by 8.30, you'll have this thing nailed, huh? you know. It's a process. It's a path. You've heard me say so many times, quote the, the Dalai Lama, who when somebody said, you know, sometimes I just get discouraged, I feel like I haven't made any progress, and the Dalai Lama said, yeah, me too. And he was really s sincere and serious. He said, but when I look back over 10 years, I see that I'm not as angry as I used to be. This is the Dalai Lama talking. It's a path. And the challenge for us is to be on the path, on the correct path, the correct as in the one that works, not like be good or be right, but the one that works, and to, and to be skillful in the ways that we, that we walk it. So the third one, in terms of skillfulness, is, is um, investigation. Uh, can the experience of this dukkha, this stress, can it be known without judgment? <laughs> I saw somebody take an in-breath on that one. <laughs> uh, can it be known without judgment? And if it cannot be known without judgment, can then just shift your awareness, there's the dukkha, right there. There's the conflict, there's the stress. That when I encounter stress, I can't, you know, it's just really hard to be with it without contracting into judgment. I might contract physically, but to really release the judgment, this is dukkha, this is stress. Can it be known? And can it be known without judgment? Mm. So we want to know um, what, what are sometimes called poisons. We want to know these stresses um, without adding another layer of stress to it. The heart of the Buddha's teachings, there are ma actually many ways that I, that I could have framed a, a talk about um, everything is workable, but I decided um, to, to talk about um, the way we um, tend to work with it uh, and the way we tend to construct views about things and how we tend to become then addicted to our views. Um, and then that ends up kind of leading us into dead ends and, and paralyzing us. Uh, the Buddha taught, um, way oversimplified, he said that any time we make a sense contact with something, you know, I see my water bottle or, you know, see the flowers, any time we make a, a sense contact, we then, we, ha we then have a certain feeling about it. We like it, we don't like it, it's pleasant, it's unpleasant. But then we kind of immediately, the way the human brain works, we form a perception. We sort of say, it's a 
water bottle. You know, it's it's now a this. It's a it's a thing that I've that I've named and I've perceived it to be that. And usually, what we go on, maybe not so much about water bottles. Um, I actually could kind of do it a little bit about water bottles. But um, usually then from the perception, we then go on to stories, to narratives about it that tend to support that perception. So that we're now relating to the world through our, not so much, you know, through the direct experience, but we're relating to our world now through the filter of those perceptions and those stories. I have a story about my own story, which I'll tell you as an example. But we all do it, and we do it all the time. It's just how the human brain works. That we tend to kind of collapse vast quantities of information into our perceptions and our stories. And then we live within those perceptions and stories. So one of the ways that the, the difficulties and the stresses keep arising for us is that we're actually not in the direct experience of it. So we don't have all the data, and we're actually living within our story. We're living within our perception. And, and so we, we kind of are, are boxed in by that, and we can't, we can't see. It's like living in a little narrow place. So I wanted to tell you a, a personal story. And I'm going to read some of it, because um, in order to protect <laughs> those who shall not be named, um, I changed the pronouns, and, and I don't want to misspeak, so I'm going to read a little bit of it to you, even though I actually remember this experience quite well, because it was quite, quite recent. Um, and it happened, it was a, a, a really quite stressful situation between myself and a relative whom I actually adore. Um, very, very fond of this relative, um, who is a Buddhist scholar, Uh, with whom I diligently ta avoid talking about Buddhism uh, because we approach it very, very differently. Uh, so we have this kind of odd, re loving relationship. It's like, how could that be that, you know, we, we don't talk about Buddhism or Buddhist practice? They asked my advice as a Buddhist practitioner, as a Buddhist teacher, about a difficult relationship issue in their family. And I told them my thoughts. <laughs> they strenuously and vigorously disagreed. Told me how wrong I was um, about it all. And I proceeded to ignore them. Until they wrote me a long email, quite a few months later actually, wanting to get something off their chest roundly and vigorously challenging my view of the matter as well as my understanding of the Dharma. Clearly, I had no idea what I was talking about. I ignored them, again, being very holy, until I realized that I wasn't actually being holy, I was being angry. <laughs> and I realized how angry I was and that I was trying to claim internally the higher ground. You know, I know, and you don't, so there. So I wrote a long email <laughs> explaining how angry I was. Uh, they wrote back, in my perception, digging in, further explaining how wrong I was. This is not really going well, is it? <laughs> this is just not going well. I wrote back accusing them of arrogance, bullying, patronizing, and a few other things that shall not be named. They wrote back. My email inbox is getting quite full. And yes, this is how wars start, isn't it? You know? So there I was, really caught in, of all absurd things, caught in this incredible argument about the Dharma. Please. <laughs> I'm sure the Buddha would approve. Um, I was caught not only externally but internally in my own views, my own perceptions, my own stories, 
rehearsed over many, 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 many years, you know, and how I view this person. Uh, profound irritation, and yes, what I realized underneath it, profound anxiety. Uh, dukkha. Caught in dukkha. Can this be known? Hmm? You know, can I, can I stop really pretending that I'm cool with this and everybody else in the world is wrong? You know, can this be known? Um, can we bring mindfulness? Can I know it in my body? Hmm? And can we investigate? What's going on here? Not like what's going, you know how the thing of what's going on here, let me examine what's going on out there. Let me explain to you what's going on with them. And that's not what, I mean. that's not what the Buddha means. <laughs> it's what's going on here. What's going on. And I didn't really know. Well, I had a clue in terms of a long history, but I didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. This is um, something from Sharon Salzberg. She said, Buddhism uses an analogy to describe what happens when we allow fixed beliefs to contour reality for us. Buddhists say that holding such views is like gazing at the sky through a straw. The sky is the unobstructed truth of who we are and what our lives are about. When a received belief system circumscribes that for us, it is as if we are looking at the truth through a narrow tube, seeing only a very small part of it, while convinced we are seeing the whole. When we are attached to our beliefs, we can spend a lot of time comparing straws. I've got a better straw than you. It's a little wider, and there's a really nice design on it. That was pretty much where I was caught. Especially in the face of fear, we tend to hold onto our straws with a death grip. I see a lot of nods. We recognize this, don't we? You know, hanging onto our straws. We read, you, know, you will open the newspaper or your, your, uh, uh, e your uh, internet tomorrow morning and you'll see, you know, a world, uh, you know, caught in the death grip of holding onto straws. Here's another story. I'll tell you the end of my story in a minute. Here's another story, and I'd like you to consider who this might be. And I've changed the pronouns again, just to mask it a little bit. But, you know, kind of consider who in, in your own perception and your own stories this might be. Um, this is an email to their partner. As for you, you are the apple of my eye and the most precious thing that I have in this world. So again, you can kind of watch the mind, you hear the words, and you can kind of watch the mind move into perception and maybe some story, who this might be. Uh, and then another email from the same person um, to uh, their daughter. By God, I miss you so much, they write. Um, how is your son doing in school? What is the, his latest funny news? This letter is short because the power keeps going on and off. Any thoughts? Who is this? Got a mind? Anybody? Osama bin Laden. A dedicated family man who deeply loved and cared for and um, stayed very closely in touch with his family. Doesn't fit into our straws too well. Hmm? All beings want to be happy. All beings everywhere are looking for happiness. So back to my story. So I realized that this email chain was getting very long and not altogether productive, one might say. Um, and so before I responded again, I asked my husband, who's just amazingly wise, I said, would you like, do you have like a long time to read this whole thing and just tell me what you think? So he read the whole 
the whole big long chain. Hands me back my computer and he said, they are afraid. They're afraid. He said, look at this word buried in there. Look at this phrase. They're afraid and they don't know it. I was like, right. And he, my, my husband kind of put it in context. And again, it was a context that neither my family member nor I had, had been referencing at all. He put it in context. He said, they're terrified. Right. You know, that my straw had not allowed for the awareness of actually all the words that were actually in the email chain, uh, nor the context in which the whole thing was e emerging, that I had kind of narrowed my focus down into perceptions and stories that were not wholesome. So I wrote and I said, um, you say, and, and I referenced the words that my husband had pointed out, and I said, I am so sorry, I missed this entirely. And then referenced a little bit more of our appreciation for what they were experiencing and going through. And, and then I said, let me try again. And I actually gave the same response, but in a much broader context. Yeah. Much broader context and with a much, uh, it was a whole different tone to my response, to which they then respo responded to me, oh, thank you. Um, because they hadn't known they were afraid either. You know? So to the investigation, the willingness to investigate, to look beyond those perceptions and stories, and in this case, the wise help of, uh, the help of a wise friend uh, who was able to kind of, you know, help me say, honey, you're caught. Um, and look at it this way. You know, so being in our bodies, noticing dukkha, investigating it, letting friends help us. I've collapsed one of them into, or two of them into one. Um, so, in terms of the conflict that you are, you you are considering, um, where, you know, for every one of us, the doorway is going to look a little bit different. And for every difficulty that arises, the doorway is going to look a little bit different. Do we need to um, be more aware that this is dukkha? Do we need to work more with um, kind of coming into just simple balance in our bodies, just nourishing ourselves? Uh, do we need to be um, practicing a little bit more deeply, bringing it out of our minds and into our bodies? Uh, do we need to... Um, would it be helpful to investigate our perceptions and our stories? Would it be helpful to get the um, guidance of a wise friend? You know, how can, you know, how can I work with this skillfully? Um, and in terms of perception, the Buddha, this is the Buddha, he says, um, how can this process be ended through a shift in perception caused by the way, the way one attends to feelings using the categories of appropriate attention. Um, rather than viewing any, any response as an appealing or unappealing thing, one should look at it as part of a causal process. When a particular avenue is pursued, 
do skillful or unskillful qualities increase in the mind? If skillful qualities increase, the feeling um, or activity may be pursued. If unskillful qualities increase, it shouldn't. There. That's easy. So uh, simply, this is Tanisaro talking, he says, simply the analysis of cause and effect. You know, distinguishing between what helps, what doesn't. Um, I'm looking to see who this is. I think it's Ayakima again. I don't have it written down. Um, but it may come as cold comfort to realize that conflict can be totally overcome only with, the, only with full enlightenment. <laughs> but the basis for it gradually eroding and these conflicts and these stresses is in, our, in the skillfulness of our practice. What is needed is a lifting of the sense of identity from its narrow fixation on the self and a broadening of it to encompass others who share our desire to be happy and free from suffering. As private individuals, we cannot <clears throat> hope to resolve by our will the larger patterns of conflict that engulf the societies and nations to which we belong. We live in a world that thrives on conflict and in which the forces that nurture conflict are pervasive, obstinate, and terribly powerful. But what we can do and must do is to testify by our conduct to the supremacy of peace, to avoid words and actions that engender animosity, to heal divisions, to demonstrate the value of harmony and concord. So the promise of our practice and the promise of awakening is that everything is workable. Everything is workable. The Buddha says in the Dhammapada, patient endurance, patient practice is the supreme practice for freeing the heart from unwholesome states. This was not said as some kind of macho challenge. This is Ajahn Amaro. Um, he says, this was not said as some kind of macho challenge, but more as a means of pointing to the fact that the way beyond suffering is neither to run away from it, wallow in it, or even grit one's teeth and get through it on will alone. No, the encouragement of patient endurance and patient practice is to hold steady in the midst of difficulty, truly apprehend and digest the experience of dukkha, understand its causes, and let them go. And for me, the letting go was in letting go of my holding on to a perception and a story that were not leading to the end of suffering for myself or anybody else. And again, remember, I started with this from Ayakima. She said, first one hears. So you've been hearing. Then one remembers. And then the question is, how am I going to do this? She says, if this step doesn't happen, no matter how many books or understandings, no matter how many Dharma talks, uh, there is no help or progress on the spiritual path. It is a path. It takes time. Uh, one can also reflect and notice that one's inner being is, in fact, changing over time, as one recalls how in the past certain things would have been upsetting, anger, sadness, worry, and now not quite so much. First one hears, then we remember, then how am I going to do this? So I invite you to take one of the pieces, you know, bring it to bear, on whatever that issue is that you've been inquiring into. How, how can I bring this? How can I bring this to bear? Thank you. Blessings. <laughs>